Hey, frog. Hey, frog. Hey, frog. Hey, frog. Hey, frog. Hey, frog. Welcome back to AWC in Conversation and our next uh, webinar for 2023. We have a great conversation coming up for you today from tropical North Queensland. Emily Rush is an ecologist based in Cairns who has embarked on a PhD project to track down one of Australia's least known frogs, the magnificent brood frog. Emily, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much for having me, Joey, and uh, happy International Women's Day to everyone out there. What a privilege yeah. it is to be able to speak today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Emily, you worked as an ecologist on AWC's science team in the Northeast region, and that's that's a big region, the way we divide it up. It actually stretches right across the top end of the Northern Territory through Cape York, the wet tropics, and right down into Southeast Queensland. So a, a massive area. Can you tell us a bit about your time in that role with AWC? Yes, certainly. So I started with AWC in 2017. And as you said, the Northeast region encompasses a huge part of the AWC properties. So all across Queensland and um, the Northern Territory. Uh, so I worked with them for about five years before starting this PhD project last year in April, 2022. And that was the full gamut of surveys for mammals, birds, uh, tracking those eco health metrics that we have in place across each of those sanctuaries and partnership sites. Yes, that's right. So, as a field ecologist um, in the Northeast, we spend about four to six months in our tents, uh, just camping out at the various sanctuaries and conducting these uh, eco health projects for monitoring the wildlife. Sounds pretty good. Um, yeah, it what, is. Were, what were some of your favourite um, moments or places that you were able to visit in that time? Uh, well, definitely uh, Pangalina 7 Emu up in the Gulf is such a magnificent property to work on. Um, and then I also have a really special place in my heart for Bower Wildlife Sanctuary out in southwest Queensland near Kunnamulla. Uh, so that one's open to the public. So a few people may have been been over there, but it's just uh, the the semi-arid zone is definitely one of my favourite places in Australia. So going out to Bower is just always such a special time. Probably looking pretty green at the moment. Um, yeah, so I think so. That, that role covered working with lots of different groups of wildlife and you've got broad interest across all of those groups. Um, but after five years of that work, you decided to do a PhD on a particularly small, obscure frog uh, known from just one one patch, uh, you know, until a few years ago in North Queensland. How did your interest in frogs develop through that work you were doing with AWC in North Queensland? So I'd always had a really keen interest in frogs and reptiles in particular. And so as part of that eco health monitoring for AWC, we develop um, targeted surveys for threatened and iconic species on each of the sanctuaries. So when the opportunity came up to develop the plan for the magnificent brood frog on Mount Zeratara Val, I put my hand up for it. And so that led me to learn uh, quite a bit more about the species. And I realised just how little was known on it and, and how little work had been done on it previously, um, which there's, really sparked my interest. There's a bit of a pattern there with frogs, isn't there? I think you know, at AWC, we talk a lot about mammals, which have suffered a, a massive extinction crisis. Of course, there are um, at least 34 species have gone extinct. Um, birds also get a lot of the limelight. There are a keen, uh, you know, a whole keen community of bird watchers and citizen scientists tracking bird populations through their observations. But until fairly recently, frogs have been a little bit overlooked. And that's not because there's a, a lack of conservation imperative. There's a, a whole group of frogs in the wet tropics that have suffered major declines. Can you talk a little bit about, about that and what, what is the major threat to some of those wet tropics frogs? Yes, yeah, certainly. So um, frogs worldwide suffered great declines um, from the early 1990s, and this was generally because of the chytrid fungus. So Australian frogs um, uh, suffered enormously and almost 20% of our species are now considered threatened and six are uh, officially declared extinct with a few more presumed to be extinct. 
And this is because of those huge losses that the chytrid fungus brought in to Australia. Um, they've also lost um, habitat worldwide, including in Queensland. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, as you said, just has uh, imperiled our, our species. Yeah, so that that's interesting because you know quite often we speak about the threats to wildlife. We can sum that up as fire, ferals, and weeds. That's true for a lot of the the mammals and things we work with. But this is a case where disease has played a major role in the decline of amphibians and that fungus in particular. If anyone's watching The Last of Us about a fungal pandemic um, <laughs> causing you know decimation of the civilization, that's literally happened to frogs already. They're they're post apocalypse um, from from that disease. So that's that's a shocking loss, but there's still a huge diversity of frogs, and we know that North Queensland is a hotspot for uh, species diversity. Can you introduce us to this particular character, the magnificent brood frog? Um, what does it look like? How big is it? Um, and yeah, where do they live? Yep, yeah, certainly. Um, so the magnificent brood frog. Uh, occurs on the traditional land of the Jerebal, Barbarum and Gugabarden peoples at, at this stage, from what we know. Uh, so their scientific name is Pseudophrony cover ceviche, and they're part of a genus that has 14 species across Australia. So the magnificent brood frog is only about three centimetres in length, so they're very small. They live under the leaf litter and in grassy tussocks. They're very colourful, obviously, as you can see in that photo. <clears throat> um, they're beautiful on top and underneath I find them even more striking as they're a mottled black and white. Uh, and each frog has a really unique pattern underneath that we can use to identify them if we need to, just like oh. our fingerprints. That's so they're really called cool. brood frogs. Yeah, they're so cool. Yeah. They're called brood frogs because they uh, lay nests in a terrestrial site and they're typically guarded by a male. And you're probably more familiar with their very famous cousin, the northern and southern corroboree frogs from down south. Right. So, so these are these... like the corroboree frogs of the north, essentially. I yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So they're the corroboree frogs are those striking black and yellow frogs that you'd be familiar with from Kosciuszko National Park. And these guys are critically endangered, um, the corroboree frogs. And if it weren't for human intervention, they'd likely have joined our growing list of extinct species. Yeah, yeah, they're in a lot of trouble. Mm. Um, you shared a few photos of uh, you working with these species and we'll we'll share them throughout the conversation. But one that struck me was just this, this image of a magnificent brood frog. I think it's an adult on a set of scales. And what's the reading there? <laughs> 1.89 grams and those bags when you take the bag off they're usually about 1.2 to 1.4 grams <laughs> yeah so that's about um I looked this up it's about half the weight of a five cent coin and yes is, so literally you're you're studying this species out in the bush uh, at places like Mount Zero Taravel isn't that like finding a needle in a haystack how do you go about that uh, yes, it is like finding a needle in a haystack, but thankfully uh, the males are very vocal during the wet season um, and they're also very territorial. So uh, as you showed in that um, video a little bit earlier, you can walk around and, and any noise that you make, um, the frogs will typically uh, vocalise back at you. But on particularly good nights, they'll just be, you know, going gangbusters and having a great time calling out to their lady friends. So once you've kind of zoned in on one, you're usually down on all fours or laying on the on the grass uh, at the side of their breeding area, uh, trying to locate them by call. So the, the males are advertising to attract females, right? And um, yes. so, and they're reacting. Do you think they react to other noises because they think you're a threat to their territory? Is that it could be, it could be that, that, that they're responding because it's a threat or that they think you're competition and they want to be the loudest thing in the landscape. And so they'll, they'll croak back at you. I'm going to play that clip again. And um, you mentioned to me that some people are better at this than others. They don't. <laughs> the well, that's what my volunteers think. <laughs> right. Um, so here's the clip. This is how walking through the bush at nighttime. Hey, frog. Hey, frog. Hey frog. Hey frog. 
Hey frog. Hey frog. It's pretty funny to read in, you know, very serious scientific papers, methodology for finding these frogs, just yell out, hey frog. I know, and that's that's exactly right. I think it was developed for the corroboree frogs um, quite some time ago. And when I first read it, I laughed. I thought it was yeah. a joke. Like I, 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 I just thought there would be so many better ways, but right. they're really, really responsive to it. So good. Um, and clearly you're a frog whisperer. That was a, a very responsive, yes. you know, reaction from that individual. So yes. I, I'm keen to find out more about your project. So this species was known from the Atherton Tablelands to the north, but um over the last few years a second stronghold has been identified further south can you tell us a little about that yes um so it i'll just take a step back and just say that the frogs were officially described in 1994 so that's only about 30 years ago and from their discovery and until 2013 they were only known from around 35 populations in that northern extent of their range that you mentioned joey and this was um, about a 25 kilometre by 10 kilometre expanse. So like a, a very, very small portion of land. And in 2013, they were discovered in the Paluma range by my now supervisor, Dr. Conrad Hoskin and his student, Stephen Zazoya. And so this extended their distribution by 160 kilometres to the south. Uh, which is where AWC gets involved. So in 2014, after their discovery in Paluma, AWC ecologists confirmed the species presence on Mount Zero Tarava. And so we mentioned briefly their habitat before. So thankfully for me, while they do live in the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area, they don't live in rainforest. Uh, and that is good for me because I don't like working in rainforest. I don't enjoy getting leeches. Uh, so they occupy the dry sclerophyll and bordering wet sclerophyll forests. And they're very particular in their habitat selection. So they like altitudes over 700 metres on granitic soils, and they live in these very, very shallow ephemeral drainage lines. So uh, there is one in this photograph, but they're often like easily missed in the landscape. Um, right. So they're so just the, a really small dip. So the middle of this photo, there's a, I mean, you can hardly even pick it. But you a, can um, hardly pick it. Yeah, but you can like see it. some like rocky areas down the bottom. And so it yeah. just follows this, yeah, very shallow little, little drainage line up. So literally like the very top of catchments where those creeks are just first um, making their way into the landscape. I think this yeah. is another one with thicker grass. But, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. It's so and subtle. so sometimes, yeah, to find them can be very difficult when you're in this very tall, thick grass. <laughs> okay, so Mount Zero Taravel was identified as kind of a new stronghold for this species, much further south than previously known populations. What does that mean? What are the implications of having, um, you know, identified a new population? And I guess, you know, what are the questions that you're trying to address through your research project? Yeah. So we didn't quite realise how important Mount Zero Tarabal was for the species in this southern extent of their range because there hadn't been any surveys there. Um, so after they were discovered in 2013, it was just kind of acknowledged that, you know, there was an additional population, but we didn't really know where they were living. So AWC started surveys for the species in 2021, and we used acoustic monitors across the property uh, to try and identify some additional populations. And we increased um, our known brood frog sites from six to 12 on the property. And to put that into perspective of just how important Mount Zero Taravel is to the brood frogs in this southern extent, they're only known from two or three sites off of Mount Zero Taravel. So all other populations in the Paluma range are on Mount Zero. And this is a tiny expanse, so about 12 kilometres by four kilometres. Wow. And so, yeah, it's it's a very significant portion of land for the frogs. Yeah, and, you know, significantly, Mount Zero Taravel is managed actively by AWC for conservation. So, you know, we're dealing with feral animals. We've got our fire management program, which is in exactly this sort of habitat, actually. It's, you know, trying to maintain a healthy regime of fire through that grassy understory, which is just where these drainage lines run. Um, so that's, you know, it's kind of reassuring to know that this southern stronghold is largely within that protected area. Mount Zero Taravel also has nature refuge status, so there's an additional layer of protection there. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of where we're working and where this population is. What about the ecology? What, what are you trying to find out about 
um, their ecology, but also their relationship within the, the broader family that they belong to. Yeah, so for my research, um, basically I, I'm very lucky in that there hasn't been a lot done on this species. So there were two surveys by government staff in the north of their range in 2000 and in 2012. And at the moment, that's the basis of all of our current knowledge. Um, and there's still a lot of unknown questions. So we don't understand their geographic distribution still. So we don't even know where they're occurring in the landscape. So I'm going to be resolving their distribution. I'd like to look at how we can best monitor them and under what environmental conditions they're calling so that we can better target our monitoring programs across their range. And this isn't just for AWC, this is for you know government staff, consultants um, and other NGOs. Uh, we're also looking at their genetics, so resolving their taxonomy and understanding their conservation genetics, so how those tiny populations are connected or isolated, if they're losing genetic diversity, and then we're also investigating their threats, the main threats to their ongoing conservation. Mm. Yeah, like all the research that AWC supports of this nature, where we're hosting PhD projects or honours projects at our sanctuaries, it's very much geared towards information that can be applied to our monitoring programs, our cons conservation land management programs at these sites. So, um, you know, this is not just kind of esoteric research into some random, you know, the random questions about this frog's life. It's actually meaningful information that will help us manage the habitat for this and other species in a better way. So, um, you know, that's the strategy for the way that we host projects like yours, Emily. Um, also interested just to hear about the support that AWC offers. So obviously we're, you know, we're a partner in this project and um, you know, I guess you've come from the AWC family, still part of the AWC family, but what kind of support do you get from having those resources on the ground? I'm, I'm so fortunate that AWC are so supportive to me in my research. So not just here, but also in the North, you know, they'll loan me, loan me equipment to use um, and down at Mount Zeratara Val, I work really closely with them to continue monitoring the frogs for, you know, part of their eco health projects and also for my own research. Um, so I'm just yeah, really fortunate in that respect. Yeah, I, the project fits right in with, you know, our objectives for uh, work at places like Mount Zeratara Val. So we're, we're so lucky to have people like you working on these species that, like you said, otherwise might, might be overlooked in our mm. broader surveys. Mm. Okay, so um, so you're taking some, you're going out finding these frogs, yelling "Hey, frog!" at night time. Yeah. And is that usually after rain? Is that, is that the only time that they call? No, so they will vocalize. So they'll obviously start in the beginning of the wet season, and so you can have like a period of rain, and when the soil moisture um, becomes damp enough, the frogs' activity will increase. So it's actually more ideal for me to go and do my surveys after a period of rain because during those big storms, the frogs often stop vocalising, I think because it's not worth, you know, the energy expenditure to put into calling. Um, and it's also much nicer for myself and my team of volunteers to not be out in the pouring rain. So ideal survey conditions for me are after rain, uh, maybe a little, you know, little sprinkling on really warm, humid nights. Mm, okay, that, that sounds all right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and when you come across a frog, so once you've detected that they are calling in one of these little drainage channels, what's your next move? Is it just writing down that they're present or do you actually take um, measurements and, and get more information once you've found these frogs? Yeah. So I've got a number of um, surveys going on at the moment. So on any given night, I could be doing call surveys where I'm uh, have a number of sites uh, across the north and south of their range and I take down a heap of environmental variables like ambient temperature, humidity, water temperature, water quality, soil moisture and then I track um, the frogs that are calling along that so I do a count of, of how many frogs are calling at that site uh, and then I'm also doing genetic surveys so at the sites for the call surveys I don't disturb the frogs I'm just there to to count and to get those environmental variables so that we can look at what conditions they're calling under. Uh, but on the nights that I'm collecting genetic samples, that's when, you know, you've got your head down and bum up when you're in the grass um, trying to seek them out. And so it, take, it can take quite some time. So often, you know, 10 to 15 minutes per frog because they're living like right into the grassy tussocks or under deep leaf litter. 
And because they're nesting at the same time, we don't want to be, you know, disturbing their habitat too much. So until you've really zoned in on the frog um, and can can be pretty certain that the leaf litter that you're going to pick up or the, or the vegetation that you're going to move has that frog under it, uh, you, you just wait it out. So, and that's where the, you know, calling hay frog comes in. I've got a, a photo that you shared with me of um, a male guarding the nest of eggs. Yes. So that's interesting too, that they're not laying eggs in the water. It's on that, that damp ground adjacent to the little drainage channels. Um, yeah. So what, do we know much about that biology of how those eggs then develop? They do, they do have information about how the brood frogs' eggs develop, but a lot of their breeding biology comes just from knowledge of other pseudophrony species. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as with many of them, they lay on their terrestrial layers. Uh, and when the wet season rains flood the brood frog nests, uh, those tadpoles hatch and are flushed into those little drainage lines to complete an aquatic tadpole phase. So they've got both terrestrial and aquatic phases for their tadpoles. Wow, so they do still rely on having water for the tadpoles. They're not entirely land-based. Yes, that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. So they need both phases. Oh, you were talking about the different um, surveys that you're running at the same time. So taking measurements of some of these frogs. Um, yes. And then also genetic samples. I'm interested in that. So you can get lots of information from a small genetic sample um, and this sounds a bit rough but how do you actually take or collect those tissue samples? Yeah so um, it is a bit rough for the frog um, but it's all very quick so we do take a really tiny portion we take the first joint of one of their toes um, so once they're captured they're put immediately into a little plastic baggie and we've got really strict hygiene protocols that we follow on site for every frog. Um, they're weighed, their snout bent measurement is taken. Um, I photograph everyone's bellies just in case I need to go back there and I don't want to sample the same frog twice. Um, and then we, yeah, we take a very small portion of the end of their toe. And okay. that's going to provide some, some really interesting uh, information as to how these populations are going across their entire range. So I'm doing this in the north and the south. Right. So getting lots of information. I mean, essentially, you're just trimming their fingernails. Um, yes. <laughs> what kind of questions can you ask with that genetic material? So there's um, questions of taxonomy and how the species are related to each other. But what about the health of each population? Can you find out about that from genetics? Yes, we can. So we'll be looking at the diversity within the populations. Uh, we'll be seeing how they're connected in the landscape. So I might take, you know, from, from one location, I'll take 10 samples and then five from another and five from another. And we'll be seeing how they're connected in the area, if they're inbred. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. So lots of information. Um, and I guess, you know, just shifting to the future for this frog, we know that it's not one of those ones where the, the chytrid fungus is a major threat that seems to operate in in cooler climates is that right um and, and especially for aquatic frogs so what are the major threats for for this species yeah so we don't know how chytrid um could impact the magnificent brood frog um but it doesn't seem to be the biggest risk to their ongoing conservation as it is with those stream dwelling frogs uh further up into the higher altitude rainforest um so for this species uh they're, they're most likely at risk of climate change and habitat loss. So research tells us that the outlook for wet tropics frogs is very grim and models have forecast up to 35% of amphibians are at risk of population decline or extinction uh, for this bioregion based on climatic changes. And because the brood frogs occupy this really narrow fragmented altitudinal band within the wet tropics and the fact that they're terrestrial breeders, so they rely on soil moisture and standing water for breeding success. Uh, it places them at huge risk from the impacts of what climate change will bring. And I'm sure a few of our uh, viewers today are aware that there's also potential habitat loss for the species across their known and potential distribution. And this is coming in the form of a series of wind farms. Yeah, so um, and we know that can affect the sedimentation in these little water courses. Yeah, that's right. So we know that roads um, can impact other pseudophrony species based on it changing the hydrology in the landscape um, and also filling those little ephemeral drainage lines with sedimentation. Hmm. 
I guess yeah. that just underscores the importance of Mount Zero Taravale as a stronghold, that we've got this southern population not threatened by any of those proposed developments where, you know, hopefully the species can persist in the longer term. Yeah, exactly. Mount Zero Taravale is a, is a really vital refuge for the magnificent brood frog in that south of its range. Emily, it's been so good to hear about this project and, and your work. Um, walking around yelling, hey, frog, to try and find the magnificent <laughs> frog. Um, you, th there's one more thing I wanted to touch on, and that was that, you know, you said that it was only discovered in 1994, this species, so or only recognised as a separate species then. And all of the records until now had been of male frogs. So they're, they're quite colourful and quite vocal and found near the stream. So relatively easier to find, mm -hmm. but you actually came across some female frogs for the first time didn't you? Yeah that's right so uh, last year in our first wet season for the frogs in February uh, myself and a volunteer were conducting surveys on Mount Zero Taravale and we started to find these really pale individuals uh, so that frog there at the bottom of the image so there's a male at the top and what we suspected to be a female down the bottom so we found three of these uh, pale individuals with a calling male so they didn't seem to be the ones vocalizing but we couldn't really prove that and so I shared that information with the community group the magnificent brood frog working group uh, who work in the north of their range um, and they subsequently went out and identified another pale individual so it was still all potential and then uh, just last month out on Mount Zeratara Valley again I was walking a transect uh, and found a very pale, very plump individual uh, just outside of the breeding area, um, I think feasting on some termites. And so, yeah, we believe that we've now identified uh, the females of this species. That's that's pretty huge. You're the first yeah. person to document the female of this, you know, really rare elusive frog. That's great. Exactly. Happy International Women's Day. That's Here's right. the female. <laughs> <laughs> Well, congratulations on that discovery. Best of luck for the rest of your field work and research as you uh, go through this PhD. I know PhDs can be arduous, but it's a pretty cool project. And I know lots of people on the call are envious of the time you get to spend outdoors in the beautiful part of Australia that is North Queensland. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Joey. Everybody. And thanks everyone for joining us for this conversation. Uh, as always, the recording will be made available. So if you know anyone who wanted to catch it and missed it, it will be up on AWC's YouTube channel. So you can just look for Australian Wildlife Conservancy or AWC in conversation. We're very grateful for your support. AWC is a charity and you can make a tax deductible donation at australianwildlife.org to help support research projects like Emily's looking at the magnificent brood frog. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.